white fat, which is a you know traditional fat that we all know about and we all have too much of and probably complain about, into brown fat, something that's uh, only recently sort of be become uh, very much appreciated. And, and brown fat has this unique ability to sort of burn off excess lipid. So in converting white fat to brown fat, we can basically take a tissue white fat that typically is, is sort of uh, made for energy storage, extra energy storage, too many Big Macs, et cetera, and we can turn that into brown fat that basically then burns off the excess lipid. Uh, so what we found is this was sort of a side effect of an experimental drug called GC1, originally developed by my former boss and Tom Scanlon. And with that compound, the, the side effect is weight loss, and it turns out that the mechanism for weight loss is this conversion of white fat into a brown-like brown -like fat. So I think by activating, by stimulating pharmacologically the thyroid hormone receptors, receptors that normally are targeted by endogenous thyroid hormone, in white fat, it looks like you can you can do this. You can do this browning effect, as it's commonly referred to. The results right now look pretty. I mean, they're pretty dramatic, right? We can take. I don't know if you've seen the images, but you can take a you know very what we call a morbidly obese mouse and get them to lose the majority of their fat mass in you know two to three weeks. It would be the equivalent. The weight loss we see in the mice. I mean, it's crazy. Uh, about a fourth, 25 percent of their body weight. So, in in a period of weeks. Now, you would never do that in a human, obviously, we would do it more slowly, but it's pretty dramatic. Brown fat's been known forever, uh, for a long time, essentially, but it's only recently begun to be appreciated in humans, in that there are a, a couple sort of recent discoveries in the past five years have, have changed sort of our viewpoint on that, which is, um, until a few years ago, it was thought that only babies or infants had brown fat, and it was thought that we as humans, we lost brown fat as we transitioned into adulthood. And I think a series of studies in the last several years have shown that that turns out to be wrong. And it looks like it's not that you lose the brown fat, it looks like we lose the brown fat activity as we age, right? And that's because we don't ever use it, right? As humans anymore, if you're cold, you put on a jacket, we come inside, you turn up the thermostat, whatever. And so we never use it, and so you just, you sort of lose the capacity for it. So it looks like, so humans do indeed have brown fat. It just looks like maybe we, it's not very active in most people. And then the second discovery in over sort of the past three to five years also is that in, in white fat, which we all sort of think about as, as being fat, it looks like you can impart some brown fat-like capabilities to white fat. And that's kind of specifically what this compound seems to be doing. One thing that I would say is on the future horizon, both a, a little bit from sort of preliminary data we have, but I think out there in popular literature and, and, this, and, and et cetera, is that one thing that seems to be very good is to really have a little bit of maybe an energy deficit, meaning maybe being hungry a little bit, right? I hate to say this, but I think as humans, probably we should be hungry, you know, a little bit hungry a lot of the time, and we're probably evolved to be like that, right? The fact now, I think that's the big problem now worldwide is you never need to be hungry anymore, right? There's cheap food uh, available all the time. And so I think, so one of the things that we're really looking at now with this compound is normally the way that you bring about an energy deficit is you cut calories, right? Here's your metabolic rate, and we cut, cut how much we eat now down, and so you have an energy deficit and you lose some weight, and that has some good properties, anti-diabetic properties, et cetera. In this case, we can kind of do the opposite, which is your metabolic rate's here. With this compound, we can crank up metabolic rate a lot and now create a similar energy deficit. And it looks like you get sort of similar effects in terms of uh, insulin sensitization, et cetera, uh, regardless of how you do it. So I really think it's that deficit in terms of energy expenditure relative to energy consumption that is, is probably good. So. Yes and no. There's one, I'd say the big obvious one in terms of, say, cranking up metabolic rate, is a calorie is called a calorie for a reason. It's energy, and you cannot burn off in an infinite amount of energy or calories. So that's the one thing is, with this process is actually referred to as adaptive thermogenesis that we induce in white fat. And the thing is, it's called thermogenesis because heat is created. So you turn this energy, the excess lipid, directly into heat. And so the problem is, if you ramp that up enough, you generate lots of heat and the body temperature goes up. And that's how the body temperature goes up on these mice. So there's one obvious thing, which is just inherent in simple thermodynamics. You can't burn off an infinite amount of calories in that you'll raise body temperature to the point that would be deleterious for, for an organism, and we can, we can see, that, see that in mice.